Uh, well, good afternoon. I'm going to uh, do another lecture on history. And this is going to be on the French Revolution and Napoleon, 1789 to 1815. I consider this to be uh, the watershed uh, of, uh, in terms of the political transformation of Europe and uh, consequences uh, that lead, its consequences that lead to the formation of the modern world, modern Western world. Um, so let's begin. Okay. I'm having a little bit of difficulty with this. Uh, next. Okay, um, so uh, we're going to begin with absolutism and the aristocratic reaction, which is the basis uh, from which the French Revolution springs. And the, uh, we're going to start with the uh, gigantic, epical figure of uh, Louis XIV, the Sun King, longest reigning monarch in European history. Uh, with all due respect to Queen Elizabeth II, uh, Louis uh, the Fourteenth, uh, uh, Le Roi Soleil, ruled from 1638 to 1715. Although he came to the throne as a minor, and he only took effective control uh, uh, from about 1650 on. Um, but he's still the longest reigning, officially the longest reigning monarch in European history. So uh, Louis's uh, reign is uh, characterized by the suppression of an aristocratic revolt known as the Fronde, uh, the slingshot or the wind. Uh, aristocrats had been uh, gradually deprived of power under the great uh, French ministers, uh, Cardinal Richelieu and Cardinal Mazarin. They had centralized authority uh, under the king and had gradually eroded the uh, privileges and the role of um, uh, aristocrats and nobles in France. Um, this uh, uh, began to irk uh, those nobles, but Louis uh, very effectively, uh, once he uh, was able, once he and his advisors, uh, primarily his mother and Colonel Mazarin, were able to uh, defeat the Fronde, that aristocratic revolt, where Louis remembered leaving the palace in the middle of the night, fleeing from... Uh, the besieging aristocrats, uh, uh, once Louis was able to uh, rule uh, on his own, um, he began to uh, uh, further the uh, centralizing reforms of his great uh, uh, predecessors, the, the ministers uh, that I just mentioned. So absolutism is the model he chose. And absolutism required the breakdown of groups and institutions that limited the monarchy by claiming that feudal, uh, feudal privileges uh, or holding uh, independent power. That is, Louis had to break down those uh, claims uh, of feudal privileges and uh, their sources of independent power. Uh, basically, systematically eliminating anything that limited his authority. Uh, or um, he never completely succeeded, but uh, he was able to uh, go along quite a way in, in, in establishing an absolutist model. Um, his sources of uh, his resources uh, that he was able to tap uh, that allowed him to uh, you know, undergo this campaign of centralization uh, was uh, the newly systems of globalized wealth that had emerged after the age of discovery, uh, exploration, and conquest. Um, 
and and uh, they were uh, facilitated by a system, an economic system known as mercantilism, which basically called for the state to regulate uh, trade so as to obtain a favorable balance of uh, of uh, commerce. That is, you uh, sold more, you traded more than you actually imported, you exported more than you imported, and you retained um, hard wealth, that is, bullion, gold, and silver. Uh, and uh, Louis was able to do this by uh, licensing, establishing new corporations, and then finally... Um, he was able to use this wealth to hire mercenary armies, uh, basically freeing him from depending on uh, aristocrats and their levies. Um, so he was able to do this. He was able to use this wealth to weaken uh, the, uh, the aristocracy's role in the military. Uh, it became a key point for the absolutist model. And it would be uh, um, repeated uh, in other places. Um, Louis uh, also weakened the aristocracy by selling titles of nobility to wealthy bourgeois no uh, individuals. These were not nobles. Nobles basically uh, were able to trace their lineage uh, back almost as far as the king himself uh, or even further. And they were able to uh, claim feudal privileges on that basis and exceptional role in uh, society, as well as exemptions from uh, certain legal uh, requirements and legal limitations. Uh, but these new uh, nobles, uh, they were called the noblesse de robe or the nobles of the robe, differed from the uh, noblesse de paix, nobles of the sword. Uh, the nobles of the sword being, of course, the traditional ones, the, no the uh, nobles of the robe being these newly minted uh, bourgeois individuals uh, who are able to use this newly acquired wealth to buy titles of nobility. But by selling these titles of nobility, uh, Louis was both, uh, um, kind of diluting the the, uh, the power and the uh, social cohesion of the uh, aristocracy, as well as uh, demonstrating to the aristocracy that he was above them and could name no, uh, nobles as he chose, that there was no limitation to the naming of, of a new nobility. So he was able to dilute the uh, social authority of, uh, of the nobility by uh, creating this new group, which, I mean, even the peasantry uh, saw these new groups uh, as uh, disdain, disdainful. They uh, basically uh, looked askance at any attempt by these individuals to uh, demand feudal privileges such as corvée labor, uh, labor or or payments in lieu of corvée labor, which had pretty much in France replaced corvée labor. Cor corvée labor, of course, means uh, la unpaid uh, work that was owed to the nobles by the peasantry, and these had been, this had been replaced by payments. Uh, that peasants made to relieve them of the uh, uh, of the uh, labor obligations, but when uh, the uh, nobility of the sword demanded these, uh, the peasants were more willing to comply. Uh, when the nobility of the robe uh, demanded uh, these payments on the basis of their of the uh, obligations. Uh, the peasantry was disdainful of, of their demands, and it eroded the authority of the nobility overall. Okay, so there are rules to absolutism, and I've put some of these here. Uh, the king is godlike. That is, the king 
stands above ordinary human beings in splendor and authority, and certainly Louis the the Fourteenth did that. Uh, there is a reason why he's called Le Roi Soleil, the Sun King. Uh, his glory was above that of uh, uh, all of France, and and he was able to shine his splendor upon France. Um, special rituals were attached to the king that illustrate uh, how distant and above all he remained. Bathing, dressing, uh, dining, everyone attended the king. That is, the nobles were required to uh, assist the king in dressing, in bathing, uh, in uh, rising from his bed, in retiring at night. Um, uh, you know, you had these uh, menial duties carried out by individuals who saw themselves as uh, perhaps, um, uh, you know, who saw the king as uh, perhaps uh, first among equals. The king certainly didn't see them that way. Certainly Louis the fifteenth, the fourteenth, did not see himself as uh, as uh, first among equals. He saw himself standing above and beyond almost godlike in relation to the uh, aristocracy. So the king is in complete control. The king paid for a military mercenary force that he paid with new royal taxes and by monopolizing and selling licenses on trade and all forms of new economic activity, tapping into the globalized wealth, sugar from uh, what is today uh, the Dominican Republic and Haiti, um, was key to this. This was a major, uh, this provided a major percentage of France's uh, uh, external uh, wealth and uh, uh, other, um, other commodities, the sales of other commodities on a major uh, kind of global uh, level was key to this uh, new wealth that allowed the king to pay for for mercenary forces uh, that were outside of the control of the traditional nobility. The uh, traditional nobility was weakened by creating a bureaucratic elite in centralized institutions that eroded the power of the aristocracy by taking over their functions. Many of the functions, local functions that were carried out by the aristocracy were taken over by uh, king's uh, representatives. This had been done on the Richelieu. These were known as intendants, and they uh, took over the kind of administration of provinces that these uh, that were reserved traditionally for the aristocracy. And the king uh, again created the. Uh, the uh, noblesse de robe, which he used in many cases as uh, his eyes, ears, and hands in the distant provinces. Uh, the uh, king also increases his authority by engaging in expansionist policies, successful warfare, in order to achieve long-held state objectives, territorial, political, or diplomatic, and key uh, in all this was the idea of France being the great nation, that is its borders and natural borders on the Rhine, in the Alps, expansion of French power. Uh, key to that was waging war against uh, what would emerge as a coalition to contain uh, Louis XIV. Uh, Louis was not always successful in this, uh, but he remained steadfast in his goals throughout uh, his reign. And then finally, key, uh, the king was the key sponsor in cultural flowering that evidences the kingdom's greatness. That is the beginning of uh, a, cultural, uh, a, a, a cultural awakening in France, a cultural... Uh, period that uh, basically creates uh, a, an ascendancy for French culture. Uh, writers such as uh, Molière and uh, musical um, creations, early operas, uh, uh, early uh, musical compositions, 
Um, this begins a, uh, a period uh, which has been uh, associated with an enlightenment, but it is kind of a, uh, a renaissance period for France, where France emerges as the great nation, the great cultural uh, uh, force or leader in Europe. Okay, so uh, Louis finally uh, also required powerful aristocrats to attend him in his monumental palace of Versailles. Uh, there's, uh, uh, they had to be away from their estates in the provinces for months out of the year. Uh, and even when they returned home, their families remained at Versailles, where Louis could always use them as leverage. Um, in fact, the creation, the uh, construction of Versailles itself was seen as a, a tool uh, that Louis used to kind of consolidate his authority by doing this and also by expending uh, a great deal of wealth, creating an, idea, uh, an ideal uh, palace for a new absolute monarch. And in fact, uh, there is an anecdote that uh, his great uh, 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 finance minister, Louis' great uh, fin finance minister, uh, Colbert, uh, basically complains to Louis uh, by saying, uh, your majesty, the state cannot afford this expenditure uh, on Versailles. And Louis famously re responded, l'état c'est moi, I am the state. And this is a key theme of absolute rule, that is the king as the state, indistinguishable from the state. Everything proceeded from the king. Even religion had to be homogenized. That is, Protestants under Louis in 1695 were uh, de denied the right to practice their religion uh, because Louis saw uh, his authority as uh, uh, only consistent with a kingdom that was fully Catholic. Uh, unlike his grandfather, who, uh, who in the Edict of Nantes had uh, allowed Protestants to practice their religion freely, Louis revoked uh, uh, that edict in the Edict of Fontainebleau in 1685, uh, denying Protestants the, uh, that same right and forcing a mass migration out of France by Protestants known as Huguenots. Uh, to uh, Holland and South Africa and other uh, parts of the world, um, even into German territory where they were welcomed by the elector of Brandenburg, uh, Brandenburg, of course, becoming in later uh, uh, years Prussia. Um, so French aristocrats also shaved under the absolutist mo model and basically, had, but had to wait the, uh, until an opportunity arose for them to regain uh, the uh, privileges and authority that was taken from them by Louis. And they would have to wait a long time because Louis lived a long time. Uh, uh, Louis' uh, absolutist program also resulted in global wars. One uh, thinks that the First and Second World War were the first global wars, and they were not. Um, uh, wars such as the Seven Years' War, which was a war fought after Louis's uh, lifetime, but uh, but wars like the War of the Spanish Succession, which was a key war during Louis's uh, reign, were fought uh, in Europe, in Asia, uh, along the African coast, in the Caribbean, and in the Americas. So they, I think... Uh, constitute the first uh, global wars, the first world wars. Um, again, uh, Louis was confronted uh, uh, in these wars by a coalition. Coalition was primarily uh, uh, composed of uh, Great Britain, uh, the Netherlands, and in many cases, either Prussia or Austria, 
all seeking to contain the ambitions of France and the territorial goals that Louis had uh, established um, in, in, in these uh, wars. Uh, these wars generally ended with French defeat or limiting treaties. They also proved very, very expensive, requiring deficit spending and borrowing, and France did not have a system of financing its debt. Unlike Britain, which very early on uh, came up with uh, the interesting concept of financing its budget through the selling debt. That is, the government would sell government bonds that uh, at a certain percentage uh, of interest, that is 14%, I think, at times. Uh, and uh, it would, if it had, a, let's say, just for our argument's sake, uh, a million pounds of debt, that is the debt that resulted from the gap between expenditures and uh, taxation or income, um, they, they would make up that gap by selling government bonds, usually at 14% payable over a 10 year period. Uh, and they found that uh, uh, individuals, wealthy individuals would uh, buy up all this debt, allowing uh, Great Britain to finance its wars much more effectively than the French, uh, who did not have these institutions and did not have the Bank of England. The Bank of England was set up in the, in the early 1600s. The Bank of, of France would only be set up by Napoleon in 1800. Uh, all these things uh, created, usually created economic crisis or fiscal crisis in France. And they would, and it would directly lead to the French Revolution. Now, Louis' death in 1715 opened the gate to aristocratic reassertion. Louis XV came to the throne as a child. Uh, and uh, basically, the nobility took uh, the opportunity to roll back many of his great-grandfather's actions. Louis had outlived his sons and, in some cases, his grandchildren uh, uh, to... Uh, uh, so that his great-grandson became Louis XV. Of course, his grandson uh, was able to take uh, the throne of Spain as Philip V after the War of Spanish Succession, which was not a, a complete defeat for Louis, but he had to accept cer certain conditions that favored Great Britain. Uh, he had to uh, accept the condition that one man could not sit on both the throne of France or, and Spain at the same time. And he had to accept that uh, Great Britain uh, uh, had control over the slave trade, the asiento, uh, that fed Latin American sugar fields with the African labor it required to sell uh, the essentially commodity of sugar. And it also had to accept uh, uh, Great Britain's growing global naval presence. Um, uh, so that, uh, but he was able to get the uh, throne of Spain for his grandson, Philippe uh, Bourbon. Right? This was the Louis came, from, uh, his family was the Bourbon family. Uh, of course, the, uh, the descendants of Philip. Uh, the uh, fifth still reign in Spain, uh, where you have uh, Philip uh, the sixth uh, on the throne. Uh, so, but the aristocracy took uh, a, took the opportunity to roll back many of the of Louis the uh, actions. Uh, they regained many of their privileges and institutional authority, restoring their feudal hold in the provinces. Uh, the nobility reasserted those rights, which included corvée feudal labor against the peasantries as well. Of course, by this time, peasants, feudalism, that is the, 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 the uh, chaining of uh, of peasants to the land where they, if the land was uh, 
so the peasants would go along with the land. That had pretty much disappeared in France. Uh, and corvée uh, feudal labor, that is the labor obligation of those peasants to their lords, had also uh, disappeared in, in exchange for feudal for uh, feudal payments, that is money was exchanged rather than labor. Um, but nonetheless, as I mentioned before, uh, some uh, you know the requirement of these feudal payments, uh, were sparked peasant discontent, and that would bubble over in seventeen in the late seventeen hundreds. As you had crop failures, there was what is known as the beginning of the mini ice age, and you had a, a series of crop failures. And in traditional societies, uh, the the same went that one uh, season's crop failure would result in. Uh, you know, riots, two years in rebellion, three years in revolution. And basically from 1786 to 1789, you had consistent crop failures in France as a result of, of, of uh, cooling and other climatic conditions. But Louis XV was able to push back. When he reached maturity, uh, he was able to reestablish royal authority, but he also angered the aristocracy to a breaking point. Uh, he also, uh, you know, and this was the other side of it, he pursued his grandfather, great-grandfather's foreign policy, but with even less success than his, uh, uh, you know, uh, overweening ancestor. Um, again, the, debilita the uh, debilitating wars uh, caused f further financial exposure, uh, financial crisis, and it demonstrated the inefficiency and weakness of French taxation because French taxation was carried out by tax farmers. There, were, there was no uh, kind of consistent uh, or um, established tax rolls. Uh, basically, these tax farmers were charged with collecting a certain fee in taxes and whatever else they could collect, they could pocket. So it also created a great deal of corruption uh, in the state and discontent among the taxpayers who never really understood how much they were uh, liable uh, in terms of taxation or uh, how this money was uh, uh, being uh, collected. Uh, consistent uh, tax rolls, efficient rationalized tax forms were, uh, and tax methodologies, taxation methodologies were only established under Napoleon in the early 1800s. Okay, I, I, I put a uh, number of wars here that the French participated in. And as you can see, the 1700s uh, was a period of almost nonstop warfare. The War of Spanish Succession, as I mentioned, being the first one, uh, Louis uh, the Fourteenth claimed the throne of France after the death of Charles II. Charles II died childless. He was the uh, unfortunate result of a lot of incestual uh, uh, inner family marriages, and he died uh, basically childless. Um, he, uh, Louis XIV, claimed that his mother, Anne of Austria, Habsburg, a Spanish princess, uh, uh, was, uh, the, the, I mean, the, his claim to the Spanish throne rested on being the son of Anne of Austria. Uh, he was opposed by a coalition of allies, as I mentioned, Great Britain, Hasburg, Austria, the Netherlands, uh, and uh, it, this war ended with that uh, kind of treaty, the Treaty of Utrecht, which allowed Philip V to sit on the throne of Spain, but required that the two crowns uh, remain independent of each other. Uh, Utrecht further consolidated British ascendancy as a maritime power. Seeding islands and strategic outposts, and Britain also obtained the very lucrative Asiento monopoly over uh, 
uh, slave uh, sales to Spanish and Portuguese colonies. Um, you had a series of wars, the War of Polish Succession, uh, then the War of Jenkins' Ear, uh, known as the War of the Asiento uh, between uh, Britain and Spain. And also France also joined Spain against uh, Great Britain, and this would be a consistent pattern. Uh, again, the War of Austrian Succession, uh, Maria Theresa uh, succession as a woman uh, to the imperial throne was challenged and, and this is also the rise, this kind of marks the rise of Prussia as a military power under Frederick the Great and Frederick the Great uh, involved himself in this war uh, very effectively and then the Seven Years War which is known in the United States as the French and Indian War uh, this war basically resulted in complete catastrophe for France, France losing its North American uh, colonies and its, in, and its uh, Indian foothold, um, as well as areas in the Caribbean, uh, a complete French catastrophe, also saw the emergence of uh, Prussia as a great power under uh, Frederick the Great. And uh, you have the kind of con the the continuing role of France in uh, in unsuccessful wars uh, throughout the period. Uh, as you can see, this is uh, Europe in 1700. Uh, the different kingdoms: Austria, uh, uh, Russia. You have. Poland and Poland will disappear uh, in a series of three partitions between Prussia, Austria, and Russia. Uh, the Ottoman, the declining Ottoman, uh, Ottoman Empire, and the declining Spanish Empire, uh, with the emergence of, of France and Great Britain leading their collective coalitions uh, against one another, and these coalitions uh, would uh, alternate. Uh, in allies, uh, sometimes Prussia would join France, but uh, in the Seven Years' War, Prussia joined Great Britain uh, to succeed finally in establishing itself as a great power. And you can see on the other side, the mercantilist uh, global system, the globalized system that mercantilism created, Kind of binding the world together in the sale of commodities and kind of uh, the uh, mercantilist uh, concept of controlling trade uh, uh, to benefit the state. Okay, American independence in the French and French involvement was very, very uh, important because Louis the Sixteenth is crowned King of France in 1774. And he continued his uh, grandfather's uh, confrontational and foreign policies in an absolutism. However, Louis' personality was not very well suited to the conflict. He's uh, been uh, seen as someone who is uh, probably a much better clockmaker. And there's always a problem with clockmakers as kings. Uh, there's a similar uh, situation with Nicholas II of, of Russia who was very much interested in clock, in the workings of clocks, the, me the mechanisms behind clocks, uh, but was not a very good ruler. And both Louis XVI and Nicholas II ended up uh, very badly uh, as a result of not being able to contain their respective revolutions. And the a key uh, component of the French Revolution is French, the French role in the American Revolution. France, of course, made the American Revolution possible. The, the, uh, the Americans would have never won a military victory uh, without French support. And France was able to do this. But in order to do this, the French expended a tremendous amount of wealth and some military resources. Uh, this resulted in uh, the only victory, the only uh, kind of clear victory the French were able to win in the 1700s in this period, which is often uh, characterized as the second hundred year war period between the French and the, and the English or the British. 
Um, the only clear-cut victory that the French were able to um, um, claim in this period was the American Revolution. Uh, but again, it resulted in an economic crisis, which uh, really called for major changes in the French system. And again, an appropriation of aristocratic privileges or elimination of aristocratic privileges and, and uh, exceptions uh, in order to establish a much more rational and efficient fiscal system that would effectively address the uh, bankruptcy of the French state. Uh, this was all going on as the Enlightenment uh, philosophies were emerging that popularized in the salons, in the cafes, in newspapers of Paris uh, that called for ration, reason, rationalism, uh reforms in society in politics in economics that uh, began to uh, challenge the traditional uh, underpinnings of, of french and western societies uh, the first individual and i will probably uh, stop here uh that uh kind of can be seen as an Enlightenment philosopher is John Locke. And Locke's uh, dates are seen uh, in 1632 and 1704. Uh, there, are, there are some arguments that the Enlightenment in terms of political philosophy begin with Thomas Hobbes, which uh, uh, his dates are you know, in the 1650s uh, with the publication of Leviathan. Uh, and the arguments um, you know, for Thomas Hobbes as the progenitor of the of political enlightenment uh, rest on the idea that, that uh, Thomas Hobbes rejected traditional legitimacy uh, or legitimacy arguments for uh, political government. And that is, uh, Hobbes did not argue that government has to be moral or has to proceed from a Christian ethos, but rather as the result of a uh, social contract between the government and the governed uh, that uh, give uh, authority to the state in order to promote uh, some of the uh, interest of or essential interests that the people have. And in uh, Hobbes' uh, Leviathan, his great political work, Hobbes argues that human beings in nature are nasty, brutish, and their lives are often short. And then in order to protect themselves, they must give, willingly give up power to the state, absolute power to the state, so that the state can effectively protect them from their neighbors. That is uh, uh, Hobbes' argument of the natural state of man is very, very pessimistic. And his uh, view is that the state must have absolute power, like a Leviathan, uh, to crush any uh, chaos, any instability, any danger uh, that might beset uh, the people. And that this was the uh, only real legitimacy of the state uh, and the existence of state power. Uh, there is an argument there. I mean, the, the rejection of, tra of traditional um, sources of legitimacy in, in, uh, in uh, exchange for a so the view of a social contract binding both government and the people. There is a, an argument that Hobbes is the, uh, the first uh, Enlightenment political thinker. 
But John Locke is a, by far the much, much more influential. And that is John Locke basically uh, writes uh, the many the kind of framework for uh, constitutional republican government and his argument is again uh, he doesn't uh, apply traditional uh, arguments of legitimacy to political power rather he also uses the social contract uh, and his argument is that in 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 the natural state, human beings cannot effectively defend essential inalienable rights. And some of you might recognize inalienable rights, and you'll be uh, right to do so because Thomas Jefferson basically plagiarized John Locke. And one uh, thinker has said that if you want to understand the American political system, all you have to do is read John Locke. I think that's an overstatement, but nevertheless, I think it's on the right track. And that is, uh, John Locke writes uh, the two treatises of government in 1689, he publishes these. And it's in the uh, aftermath of the glorious revolution of 1688, which uh, creates uh, constitutional monarchy in England um, when James II is overthrown and replaced by William of Orange and James's daughter Mary. Uh, William and Mary, of course, uh, are called to rule in England by Parliament, but they have to first acknowledge the uh, uh, sovereignty of Parliament and they have to acknowledge a, the English Bill of Rights. And this is the end of the uh, political strife that uh, England had to deal with uh, throughout the 1600s, and it's the English Civil War, and uh, it ends with the Glorious Revolution. And uh, Locke is the primary defender, kind of, uh, uh, his the primary philosopher of constitutional uh, republican government or constitutional monarchy. Uh, that is, the, his argument is that there is a social contract between the uh, people and the government and that the people voluntarily give up uh, certain rights and acknowledge the authority of government in exchange for the government's protection of certain inalienable rights, that it, those are life, liberty, and property. Very key. Those three rights are seen by John Locke as essential and uh, uh, to the social contract. And the idea that uh, government exists is uh, framed by Locke to uh, tie in a kind of argument that says that government only exists to protect those rights. And once government uh, doesn't, if government doesn't protect those rights, then the contract is broken and uh, the people have the right to uh, kind of uh, establish a new contract. Uh, so it creates a uh, rationale for revolution. This is an argument for the first time uh, that legitimizes revolution should government not protect these inalienable rights. Uh, Locke also argument, uh, argues that a uh, very rational uh, view of God as a, a kind of mechanistic principle that regulates the universe by imposing Newtonian laws and then stepping away. And Locke's epistemology as a study of knowledge argued that there were no ideal forms and these could not be the sources of knowledge. Rather, he uh, postulated, he argued that all knowledge depends only on the senses. He fully expressed those views in his essay concerning human understanding, 1690. And this was a kind of political argument that emerged out of Newton's uh, work, uh, the Principia, that is his, uh, Newton's uh, work in physics led to a, a kind of argument that Locke employs here, uh, arguing for rational forms 
uh, that God has used to kind of create the political process or the, you know, and then kind of stepping away from it. Uh, so Locke is the, the first major uh, figure in the Enlightenment and contractual government. He will be very, very important to the American political system, as I mentioned, and he will, uh, his arguments will dominate a, a particular face in the French Revolution. Uh, we, we will move on to other philosophers um, in uh, later lectures, but Locke is, I think, the beginning, the touchstone of uh, con contractual constitutional government in our uh, survey of the French Revolution and Napoleonic period.